In this video training, we'll see how to identify the various stages of the SAS 12 gig link-up procedure, including speed negotiation as well as receiver and transmitter training. For viewers that are familiar with the SAS 6 gig standard, the main difference is that now with 12 gig, devices will perform dynamic equalization at power on. This is done in band and it's intended to improve signal quality on the link by letting the FIs adjust transmit parameters at the far end so it can receive the best eye possible. The Teledyne LaCroix Sierra SAS bus analyzer lets us see most of the link up process. It lets you verify timing of the different state changes during the link training procedure. It lets you investigate and debug problems when devices won't link up. This list highlights the sequence that's followed by SAS 12 gig devices. It starts with the OOB handshake. Both sides go through speed negotiation windows 1 and 2. You should see both sides sending out lines at 3 gig at this point. Upon completion of this initial speed negotiation, again, if both sides support SNW3, they will exchange PHI capabilities messages. This lets the other side know basic PHI parameters that will be used in the next stage, 12 gig training. Most devices today support transmitter training, and then finally, receiver training. During this final stage, most FIs are just sending the training pattern, which repeats. But there's also a series of messages exchanged between link partners, which are called transmitter training information units, or TTIUs. At a high level, TTIUs are a critical part of the 12 gig link training because they direct the far end transmitter to adjust the training coefficients. Each PHI uses their own algorithms to tweak de-emphasis and pre-shoot to try and open the eye. This is all done in real time over the back channel. So these TTIUs become a record of what happened on the link. So they're important for debug. Again, almost all of this is visible on the bus with a protocol analyzer. So we'll walk through this so you can see what that looks like. Here, we're now in the Teledyne LaCroix SAS protocol suite and we're looking at a trace of a power on between two 12 gig devices. By default, the software will show this packet view, which may be the best option for viewing the link up sequence. It provides the most detailed information. Just before the common it, it's common to see packets labeled as link data, which is really the start of a common NIT. This is sort of a byproduct of the analyzer trying to identify that OOB sequence, which is a line burst followed by idle. It takes a few microseconds before the software concludes that it's actually recording a common NIT sequence. So then it starts labeling the sequences as common NITs, which are shown here. We can see the actual intervals between the aligns, which is really how you distinguish between the different OOB signals. Typically, you see the initiator side sending OOB while the device is still powering up. Once both sides are transmitting common NITs, we see that the software automatically groups these handshakes into events called SAS to SAS Phi Reset. So this single event encapsulates the SNW1 and 2 plus the Phi Capabilities Exchange. There's two of them because SAS drives are double ported. Both Phi's on the drive are going to train when they're connected to a Phi on the other end. I can use the channel buttons to hide the link to as the second link is not going to be used unless you're attached through a fabric to a second initiator. So now we're just looking at a single exchange between a single port pair. Here we can open this Phi reset event to see the individual common its coming from initiator and target. You don't see the actual aligned primitives. We're showing the burst and idle intervals, which is what defines an OOB signal. So. You should see 160 OOBI for aligns and 480 on the idle interval. If you want to verify actual OOB timing, we have a waveform view that gives you a graphical display where you can make timing measurements. Down below we show you the progress as it builds the view. When it's open, you really need to take it out of compact mode. Here I can measure by just right-clicking and then left-clicking. The idle interval, which is defined at 1440 OOBI, or 960 nanoseconds, 
it basically won't match the accuracy of a scope, but lets you quickly check whether one side might be out of spec to see measurements for the target side. You basically want to click on the target com SAS event, which nominally should be 160 OOBI. We're showing as a 156 or about 103 nanoseconds. So give or take close to the required align interval. You want to put it back in compact mode to see the aligns. And then scrolling down after the OOB events, we see activity on. This is a marker, really, for the start of speed negotiation. This is the SNW2. We see the align zero at three gig. You can do the SNW measurements like the RCDT and the SNTT. If we continue scrolling down, we eventually see the calm wake, which is not a calm wake, really. It's really the Phi capabilities messages, messages that are actually encoded in OOB symbols. Each burst represents one bit of the 32-bit values that allow devices to advertise their function, things like maximum connect rate. You can see that we decode each bit in the waveform view, but if I go back up to the SAS to SAS Phi reset event, we have a full decoding of the capabilities bits here in a format that's similar to the spec. Both initiator and target send Phi capabilities, and here for the target side, we see all the other bits as they were captured, and we can see it's a Gen 4 capable device. But this is one of the first places you'll need to look if there are problems between two link partners. These Phi capabilities are sent during SNW3. So I'll close this. But this single event encapsulates SNW1, 2, and 3 in a single convenient event that you can now use to start your analysis of link-up problems. The fact that we see Phi capabilities from both sides means these devices completed SNW3 and are now ready to start 12 gig link training. Now in the event that there was a problem with the OOB exchange then you would see an incomplete under status. For backward compatibility there's a lot of complicated rules about what the fallback sequence is if a device doesn't complete a specific stage of the SNW timing window. But as long as all the SNW timing windows are valid, as we see here, the device should move directly into 12 gig training. I'll close the waveform view, and now we'll look at the training sequence. So after the five capabilities exchange, devices are supposed to move straight to 12 gig training. Now, assuming both sides support transmitter training, you'll see these 12 gig training sequences. These are specific to the transmitter side training. The receiver side training, which is performed with the training primitive, will come next. There are numerous timing parameters that must be met to be compliant with the 12 gig training sequence, such as the RCDT time. The devices are supposed to wait 500 microseconds between the last fight capabilities bit and the first training pattern. We can make that measurement, but first, here's an important tip. Recall that we roll up all the SNW states into this fire reset event. But now I want to see all the events chronologically. To do that, click on that first training sequence and use the clock button, and the display will change to show each event sequentially. Now I can easily see that last Phi capabilities bit and make a X to Y measurement to make sure that RCDT timing is at least 500 microseconds. Recall that we'll always see a running disparity or symbol error when the analyzer is doing comma detection and locking on the 12 gig signal. But now let's get back to the 12 gig link training. Most of today's high speed protocols utilize training to optimize the signal integrity at the receiver. But SAS 12 adds the ability to train the far end transmitter as well. A training sequence consists of a scrambled zero pattern and a TTIU. We're actually only showing the TTIU information in the trace display. We label it as a training sequence, which is divided into a training control word and a training status word. So they're word size structures, each 16 bits in length. They're sent by both the initiator and the target phi. These are the bytes in hex, but if we open them, we'll see the decoded values. 
I'll turn off the wrap so we can see all the values. In the control word, we see there are three coefficient request fields. With these three fields, labeled 1, 2, 3, each file can request a change to the current values. These values are increment, decrement, and hold. This is how each PHI tries to dial in the best settings from the far end transmitter. So it's a relatively simple mechanism that lets a PHI walk up and down different reference values, allowing the receiver to basically compensate for loss within the channel. On the status word, there are also three corresponding coefficient status fields, also labeled one, two, three. This is the back channel communication, telling the far end that it made the last adjustment. The values here are ready, update complete, meaning I made the change, and then minimum and maximum to tell the far end that you've reached the upper limit or the lower limit for these parameters. Scrolling through, you'll see that most of the coefficient settings are set to hold, which means the phi is not requesting any changes during that sequence. I can tell by the values all zero. And if I open these up, we're going to see hold and ready, plus the count, which tells us how many were sent. Could be from a few hundred up to a few thousand. Then it's the software that breaks the next event into a new sequence anytime there's a change requested. Here the target side is requesting a decrement of coefficient 2. It's going to repeat this sequence until it gets an update complete from the far end which usually occurs within two or three sequences, as we see here. Those are the TTIUs we're more interested in, where the control word is requesting a change. So there's an option to filter based on these fields. We go to Filter Setup, Training Sequences. You need to check the control status, and then you can press the Advanced button. Here we can choose to show or hide packets based on the contents of the training sequence fields. You can choose the individual fields like show only increments or hide any packets where request equals hold. Then hit OK. Make sure it's set to hide. Now we're looking at only TTIUs where a change was requested. And what we see is that it's only the target side phi that is requesting coefficient changes. The initiator is transmitting hold for all coefficients. To make this easier to see, I can use the right click, expand all, just on the control word. I'll turn off the wrap, and then we can scroll over, and we can see the target requesting numerous changes while the initiator is standing pat. Possibly the initiator has more margin in its phi. It's getting a clean eye from the far end. Now a key consideration here is the impact of the analyzer on the equalization because some analyzers that are based on signal redrivers can effectively distort this training behavior. You want the most non-intrusive probe possible. That's where Teledyne Cray has really set itself apart with our TAP3 linear probe design. It's designed to pass through traffic with minimal impact on the signal because you want the equalization to behave as though the analyzer isn't there. For more details on this, I would direct you to our technical brief, A Practical Guide to 12 Gig SAS Probing Methodologies, which you can find on our website. Back to our transmitter training, there are literally thousands of training sequences from the target phi. So just like we filtered based on field, we can also search on any field. Let's go ahead and bring back the initiator training sequences. I'll close these control packets using Collapse All. Then we'll go to the search button under Training Sequence. We'll check the control status, then we get the Advanced button. Now we can search on the Train Complete field. I set Train Complete to 1 and choose it as the search item. I'll now click OK and hit Find. This is going to take me to the very first training sequence where Train Complete is done. Of course, it's the initiator that sends train complete first. Let's go ahead and right click, set the timestamp origin on the current position. Now we'll use the F3 key, which will find the next occurrence of train done. And finally, we find the target side 
it's the last training sequence where he also indicates train complete. Under the status field, we see train complete getting asserted, and we also see that this occurs 768 microseconds after the initiator sends train complete. Now, this is where the metrics can be helpful. I'll turn off the wrap and open the metrics dialog. These are custom statistics that the software calculates. Things like how many TTIUs were sent in aggregate, how many times coefficient 1 was incremented and decremented. It shows the delta. And we can see that this target requested four more decrements than increments. This can help you spot patterns. Maybe there's some optimization you can do for this phi if he's consistently decrementing coefficient 1. Tooltips explain what the metrics actually mean, and on this final TTIU we see completion time, which is the elapsed time to perform the transmitter training. 255 milliseconds, well within the 500 millisecond timing window required by the spec. The goal should be to reduce the training time. That means you have more margin in the phi and more likely to get to the 12 gig transmit rate. With transmitter training done, both sides can switch to receiver training and immediately start sending the train primitive. We'll see that repeating pattern until we eventually get to the train done primitive. And uh, we can search on that specifically from the target side. And here, of course, is the target side sending train done. Scrolling down from there, you should very quickly see the very first identify frames being sent at 12 gig. That should give you an overview of the 12 gig link training sequence and some of the techniques you may need to troubleshoot and debug 12 gig link training.